what sort of things we've received, and then talk about next steps. And yeah, I think to, to talk about the program, it's important to, to look at this in terms of how this program has evolved and, and how it will continue to evolve. Uh, the, the commission, High Speed Rail Commission, was set up way back in 1996. Um, you know, at the time, uh, there was no funding provided other than for very preliminary type activities. So uh, this really was a planning activity. And that's how the program went along uh, until 2008 when uh, Prop 1A was passed. November of 2008, the voters passed Prop 1A. And for the first time now, the state had available uh, funds to not only do preliminary planning, but to move into construction. Um, however, um, those funds were conditioned, uh, among many other things, on uh, matching funds coming from some other source um, to match at least on a one-for-one -one basis. The bond funds could not be spent for construction uh, until and unless they were matched at least one-for-one. -one. And at the time when Prop 1A passed, uh, there there was no other source of funding. Uh, the federal government had never provided any funds for high-speed rail development. Um, and the private sector interest, uh, the, the presumption of private sector involvement, which was always there, um, had, was not clearly defined or potentially even understood. Um, but then 2008, President Obama was elected. 2009, the, the Stimulus Act, the RF fund, um, our program put into place and then subsequently the next year of a pro federal appropriation for the first time then the program received a source of outside funding so that it could access the Prop 1A monies um, and that came in the form ultimately of, of about 3.3 3, uh, 3 .3 or so billion dollars in federal funds which could be leveraged against the Prop 1A money meaning we could actually move now into this being a construction and a development program. And those funds, of course, are the ones that, that got the work started in the Central Valley. Um, but still a long way away from being able to develop the entire program as a program. Um, in 2012, uh, the next big step in the program was the passage of the appro first appropriation of the state dollars to, to move forward with the program. Um, and then, you know, hugely significant, last year, uh, the proposal from the governor and the um, implementation by the legislature of uh, the commitment of cap and trade proceeds to a number of programs on an ongoing basis, um, certainly for us most notably, the 25% the of those proceeds going to high-speed rail development, uh, along with other funds going to transit rail, affordable housing, and uh, sustainable development. The commitment of cap and trade it was a very significant step. We'll see ultimately exactly how it plays, but it marked a significant turning point in our interactions with the private sector. And um, when I talk about the private sector in this, what I'm talking about are the entities that would be involved in all aspects of the program from financing, planning, design, uh, delivery, maintenance, and operation ultimately. And um, I would characterize the discussions we had with the private sector prior to cap and trade as uh, they were very interested. They saw the underlying merits of the program, believe it would work, but basically said, you know, come back to us when you're real and come back to us when you're ready to actually talk about being able to move forward in a partnership basis. The cap and trade vote created the beginning of that process and um, our discussions with the private sector changed dramatically as a basis of that because they now now saw that California in fact wanted to move ahead to complete this program and uh, so we've had uh, since that time extensive discussions with the private sector about how and where they might participate under what conditions what we would have to do additionally in order to uh, create the opportunity for that participation how it might work, and we took the opportunity through the RFEI process to put some structure around those discussions, to ask them specific questions uh, about how they thought we could most efficiently deliver the program in terms of integration of various components of it, how big a, a, a program is, is uh, possible under uh, existing financing mechanisms and given capitalization sizes and things like that. 
And we, we took that step and, and advised the board we were going to issue the RFEI, and I think it's a, it's a fairly unusual step for a public agency to go out and engage the private sector, the people who will help us deliver, really with the intent then of, of giving us information and input that will help us do a better job of developing that delivery plan. And that's what the RFEI was intended to do. And uh, we're very pleased with, with the process. Um, on September 28th, uh, we received uh, proposals from 36 different entities, um, and they're, they're listed here before you. I think what's uh, very noteworthy and significant is both the volume and the caliber of the respondents here. Um, you see here, this is uh, pretty much a who's who of people who would be involved in, in big infrastructure around the world, um, again, in all aspects, from financing through delivery, uh, operation, and, and maintenance. And it's also notable that we see some um, very important early efforts of, of people coming together in teams and in indicating, again, some of the ways that this program could be packaged. We were very clear, and, the, and the, the proposers understood this is not an actual procurement. No contract is being awarded as, a base on, as based on this, but, but the response was, uh, was very, uh, very positive, um, very encouraging, and I think really underscores the level of interest uh, throughout the industry, around the world, in this program. Um, you see here just a, a representation of where the proposers are based in terms of their headquarter functions. Um, if we superimposed on this where they have worked and delivered programs, pretty much the entire map would be uh, colored in. Again, we've got people who, teams who have delivered programs all over the world and who are the leading experts in doing this. Um, and among them, you know, we see tremendous experience in infrastructure. Again, not just high-speed rail. Um, certainly, we are interested in people with high-speed rail experience and their components of the project that are unique to high-speed rail, but others that are not. Um, and so, again, we see leaders in infrastructure of all sorts um, from around the world. And, you know, we talk about around the world because, frankly, the, the rest of the world has been considerably ahead of the U.S. in terms of public-private partnerships, alternative delivery mechanisms, and we see a lot of the expertise coming to us in different aspects of it from around the world. So again, we're very gratified to see that experience. Um, just then talk about next steps and where we are, because again, this is, it's a very important step. It's a promising step, but it's a step. Um, and um, we will now, based on having received these, we're still going through them. Um, but we're going to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with, with all of the firms and all of the teams that submitted to make sure we understand um, what, they, what they suggested, what kind of questions they're raising, um, and uh, we will come back to the board, to the public, to the legislature with, with a summary of all that um, in the coming months. And then the, the long term, and when I say long term, we're not looking too far out in the future, um, but the intent is to then use, take this input as, as important uh, contributions to developing the plans for how we, in fact, move forward to get to an operating system of high-speed rail in California, utilizing um, the tools that we have available to us and uh, with, uh, in partnership with the private sector. So, Mr. Chairman, that's... Uh, our update of where we are, and I'd certainly be happy to take any questions or, or comments. Um, I, I did have one comment, but I want to give colleagues an opportunity to go first. Um, Mr. Curtin, did you? Well, I don't have any good questions, but maybe some will get generated. But I do want to, you know, suggest that, yeah, this is one of the key turning points because uh, there's an awful lot of excitement and discussion, and 36 responses is pretty impressive. So. Uh, so you guys have done a good job putting this on the table. It was RFE, the request was before I got here, but it was really a, a, good, a good move. And, um, it makes it look a lot more serious than it did three months ago. We're in a, uh, somebody, uh, actually I, I, I've stolen a line somebody else used, which was a, a few years ago, we went to New York to meet with all of these kinds of parties and spent about a week doing that. Since cap and trade passed, now they're coming to see us. Right. You know, and again, they're not bringing a checkbook with them yet, <laughs> but they're bringing their ideas, their interest, you know, their commitment to work with us, and are, are really engaged. And I think this process is 
will yield a better product in terms of a path forward for us as we define what we can do, when we can do it, and, and how to do it. Um, question. Uh, yes, Mr. Correa. Mr. Morales, just to, to clarify you, how many of those bidders, how many bidders did you have? Project proposals. Respondents. Respondents, yeah. We, we Thank tried, you. We've avoided using bidders because it's not a procurement, but 36 teams responded. Now, those, all of them to build the whole no. project or different stages? Different stages. And what we focus the questions on. So you had some that wanted to build the whole project and some portions of it? Correct. We've got a range. Uh, there are a few consortia that you see among those bidders who basically said, give us everything. Now, again, the particulars to be worked out, but that they, they bring to the table the, the capacity they believe to deliver everything in partnership with us. Others are much more focused on specific elements. And then so what's the next step to, now? So the next step is to, to sit down and go through what they submitted with each team, uh, make sure, again, we understand what their points are. Um, we can have some back and forth with them. One of the advantages of a process like this is because it's not an actual procurement is we can have an ongoing dialogue and really you know learn from them and refine the process as we go forward um, and then you know over the next next year or so then come you know start to shape what a large procurement or procurements toward an operating system uh, would actually look like and be able to go out with one so these actual I names appear each group proposed different ways of approaching the problem, so to speak, and I've got to go back and review each one of those and determine what is best for the state of California. Right. Thank you. Uh, maybe, yeah, I, I'd like to just pick up on that, Lou, because um, you've hit on something that I think is important for us to clarify for the public here, and I just, I mean, th this has been, I think, a remarkably successful uh, enterprise in a lot of ways, but I just want to make sure that we're not creating expectations about what these folks are telling us. Um, I've sat down, I've read all of them now, and um, the, first of all, I think the first thing that needs to be said is thank you. This is, these are big companies that do a lot of work and they have spent a lot of time. Um, you know, there are a couple, some of them fall in the category of, hey, we provide these kinds of services, you know, signaling, track stuff. We, We've got a great track record around the world, and you know you should bring us into your project, which is that, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but I mean, a lot of people have put a lot of thought into this, and coming back and saying to us, um, you know, answering some questions that are really going to be important questions as we go forward of how we organize this, how we break this into pieces, what things we accumulate into a single procurement and what things we keep outside of that. Um, and there are different strategies there that could lead us uh, to, to either have more competition or less competition, depending, I mean, it, it's a balance. If you, if you make really big contracts, you can, and you, you hand it to somebody to manage, you reduce your risk of integration between all the different components. On the other hand, you may limit yourself to just one or two big global players or teams. And so this is a balance that we're going to have to strike uh, as we look at the best way to deliver the project physically. So I would say the first aspect of this is that we've gotten a tremendous amount of thinking from the best people in the world as to how a project like this should be phased and sequenced and delivered uh, in the most efficient and effective way. And that's going to be very, very good. And as the staff goes through their one-on-ones, they're going to have an opportunity to, to further explore that. Then you get to the people who say that there are um, these techniques of public-private partnerships where somebody will front the money and will essentially take a responsibility to sh have the risk shifted from us to them to actually design, build, finance, operate, maintain, and through the entire operation of the system. And this has been done successfully in Europe, much less so in the United States for a lot of reasons. I mean, I've been involved in this kind of area for about 10 years of my professional life. Um, and people are coming to us saying, this is the model that has worked other places, and you could do this here. But that model, we need to understand, is a financing model. It's not a funding model. It's basically taking 
resources we have now from cap and trade and saying if we want to commit those to somebody in the form of a, what's called an availability payment that they can you know deliver that part of the project and they're telling us how big that could be what the market can support and so forth the problem that I have is that um, in a lot of the political dialogue and you know this better than anybody sitting at this table um, people tend to garble up what they mean when they talk about the private sector coming in private sector was always going to be part of high-speed rail either in a traditional procurement or through one of these alternative means like a public-private partnership but when people who say that talk about the private sector what they're really talking about is who's going to bring new money I mean we've got as Jeff went through we've got the bond money we've got the federal money we've got the cap and trade money all those things together are not enough to build a 68 billion dollar system so we need that other piece of money that is new money and that comes where does that new money come from in large measure it comes from the ridership revenues that are going to be generated how do you tap that well this is the issue is when you talk to these folks the only way you tap that at this point and this is something I learned about five minutes after meeting Mike Rossi four years ago <laughs> is that the only way you do that is one of two ways either you give them a guarantee or they see enough ridership history that they're willing to take that risk and we're not there yet and what I'm seeing from these proposals does not put us there yet in terms of a revenue concession model that adds 20 billion dollars of new money that we've estimated could be supported from the projected revenues of this project we're getting in that direction but we're not there so I just want to be careful because when people start to sit down and look at these what they're going to see is a tremendous response a tremendous amount of innovation but also an honest assessment on the part of these global players that you know guys you're going to need to either have some backstop for us which frankly we're legally limited from doing under the provisions of the bond act or we're going to have to see enough ridership history that we can then be comfortable moving forward so it is a step I just don't want to get too far out ahead of ourselves in what we're telling the public and ourselves is going to be is going to be inherent in these uh, in these responses at least as as I've read them um, it still gives us a great basis for conversation and discussion but um, Mike I don't know if you want to add anything to this because I mean this is this is something that you've been very clear on since the beginning it's been very helpful for me to understand it from a from a financing and uh, st standpoint and funding and I think you covered it pretty well and, and, and I think that we have to be clearly attuned to what Jeff said there's no proposal right there's no commitment to do anything other than talk. right nothing it is a clearly a, an expression of interest and in fact in the financial world when we use the term an expression of interest these would not qualify because there's si somebody signing well, because an expression of interest is I'm willing to do a B C D E and F if X Y and Z happen these are not uh, you have to look at these in, in two, I'd say two parts Jeff maybe you'd say three but I'll say two and you can correct me the first part the part that Jeff said is so valuable is the conversation as to how you construct this this high-speed rail endeavor and talking about horizontally on infrastructure you, know, you do a series of biddings and you, you look at one or two people in the area of the acquisition of electronics, catenary, those type of things, there's only a couple of suppliers in the world. All of those kind of structural things that, as, as Jeff was referring to, are very, very interesting and will be very helpful to try, as you say, try to figure out how we build this thing. The section that pertains to finance, there is absolutely nothing new in it from all of the conversations we've had from day one as to the requirements that people believe are necessary in order to make funding available at an earlier stage so you just want to be very very careful this is an expression of interest which is basically goes like this we think you ought to do the following things and we want to participate as long as you do it the way we'd like it to be done 
that it, it, and so in the finance side, that's a non-starter because we already have a set of requirements from, from the Fed, from the state. And, and the issue of then how you try to use those, how you try to use the funding that we have with the potential for, for what do you call it, Jeff? Value engineering, reducing the price that we were originally budgeted, squeezing down the cost of this thing to, to lower, the, to minimize the gap, that the, the new money that Dan is talking about. That's really what this game is going to be about. Uh, and the first part of these, uh, of these expressions deal in some respects with that issue. The financial part, the second part, is nothing, nothing new, uh, although I will tell you there is one, one write-up which is extremely good from the point of view of things that should be done uh, or could be done. And, and you I thought there were actually a couple on that one. But well, there's one that's in depth. Yeah. It's the market. Uh, and it covers all of it, all of the, I think all of the potential ramifications of financing. So I, I, I would just echo uh, what the chairman said. We need to be very careful in talking about these things as to what exactly what they are. Uh, and, and I also think that uh, it is extremely interesting to understand that the uh, private sector is not saying that they don't want to be involved. Quite the contrary. They are saying they want to be involved. It's a matter of how we structure it. Yeah, in some ways, the most, maybe the most significant thing about this is up until now, we and program proponents have said the private sector will be there. Now the private sector is saying we'll be there under the right set of circumstances and, and here's how we'd like to be there. But that's, you know, what you see in these, in these responses is a pretty significant investment of time and money by these firms just to put these responses in, yeah. which is really indicative, again, of, of a very positive step and a commitment. And so, you know, what we want to do is, main, you know, take this, use the momentum, continue to move the process forward, flesh it out, and figure out, uh, d devise the best plan for going forward. And that's, again, I think the a key to this program is we're going to continue to adapt as circumstances change, as opportunities come up, um, and you know, we, we, we've proceeded the way we have with the, C, the, the first construction packages in the Valley because that's what we could do with the money we had at the time. The, the idea is to now change that direction and, and do this much more strategically as we go forward. Yeah, I think what I'm concerned about is that we, we live in a world, and this is the political world that I'm talking about for a moment, we live in a world where people make statements that if this were really a worthy project, then the private sector would be here. And most of the people who make those statements have not spent any time in the private sector. They don't know anything about the private sector or how it operates. And, um, and, and, and frankly, they don't understand that the private sector prices risk. And a lot of what we're getting in these responses is people giving an assessment of what the risk is and how we could mitigate that. Now the the drafters of the Bond Act, in their wisdom, went to the voters and said there will not be an operating subsidy for this. You cannot use the bonds if there's a federal, state, or local operating subsidy. If you're looking at how these things are built around the world, there's always that part where you have to get over that first gap before you get the ridership history. Governments fill that gap. And Mike Rossi made a comment the other day that I thought was really smart, which is that, in fact, what you discern when you read these is what they're really saying is government needs to be more aggressive about getting us over that gap. And when they are, you're going to see an unleashing of a lot of private sector dollars. But I just, you know, unfortunately, because people butcher the sense of what it is that the private sector does, um, you know, we have to deal with that. So what we've got is just what we've said. We've got uh, tremendous expressions of interest from people who, who want to do this and who have some very good ideas about how we should do it. Um, but we still have a funding gap. And, um, uh, and, and, but we're going we're gonna to build this project, notwithstanding that, uh, because we can close that funding gap but we're just going to have to do it in, in probably a more systematic way. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman and Chairman. others, I just wanted to thank you for having this discussion because I want to make sure that we're clear to the public. That's right. 
as to what is the state of this high-speed rail and what these 30 names are proposing and what they're not proposing. I think uh, unless you really read between the lines, so to speak, uh, it's very difficult to ascertain what you just stated. And I, I want to thank you for those comments. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, I didn't see who went first, but we'll but just come down the line. No, no, go ahead. All right. So um, I feel a little disadvantaged because I haven't had a chance to read them, and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, I feel very optimistic about a couple of things. Uh, there really is not any new money, and uh, there may be some new ideas about money. Uh, you've raised one repeatedly that I think has is, is got great potential, which is the real estate uh, uh, values uh, surrounding this project around the state. I think what the private sector does, and hopefully they're, they're throwing enough clues out there as to when they'll step in under what circumstances, but they reduce costs, as you said, because they bring innovation in a way that uh, we're not used to doing through the normal process of, of building our infrastructure. They transfer risk, which has a way of reducing costs if it's done properly and people understand it. But they also amortize the costs over a period of years. So what people think of as a $68 billion project or whatever number people want to throw around, if it's, if it's looked at it as a $68 billion project that's paid for, like your house, uh, where you don't put $68 billion on the right. table, you put you know, a mortgage, a slight little piece of your mortgage down and you amortize it over 50 years, it becomes a different cost concept. That is, uh, you, can, you can get your head around it and government and ridership uh, can actually end up figuring out how to do it. And that's what it brings because if we're sitting here trying to figure out how to raise the money constantly, uh, it, it becomes, we get lost in that rabbit hole. But if they're saying, and I, I believe they might be, that if this project is actually going to work for 30 years or 40 years, we will put up some upfront costs, we will take some risk, we will bring innovation to bring your cost down, and we will look to that 30 to 40 year period to get our money back through this process. Okay. And that's really what the private sector brings to this. Okay. And we don't normally do our big infrastructure, as you well know, through that process, we fund it, which is what everybody gets their backs up over. So uh, it's hard to tell what the ridership risk is going to be because we don't have a high-speed rail train. But there are some places that it's pretty clear people will get on this train, and I believe, having been on a few, once you're on it, it's going to be something you want to get back on if you have a regular transportation need in this state. And if, even if you're doing a trip up north, I know we look at the numbers now, but a family trip from north to south uh, it becomes very attractive as an alternative. So I, I think the potential there is tremendous. But those are the issues that I've been looking at, and I believe there's enough people, as you can tell by the re response here, that think this thing has a real uh, potential for providing those kind of resources that they're willing to take the risk, at, at certainly up front. I, I'm looking forward to reading it, so I, you know, maybe I'll be proven wrong in one case or another, but hopefully not. Oh. Well, I, I'm going to shorten considerably because I think uh, you said a number of things, to Danny, that I was thinking also of. But I think that really what we got here was I was surprised at this number of responses. Uh, it was, I would have, you could have easily called this a request for information as, as easily as you could have said just a request for expressions of interest. I think we got exactly what we anticipated we would get. I'm amazed at, uh, I, I'm happy to say I'm amazed that there are so many major companies around the world who are seeing this project as the, the viable project that it has become. And this is an indication of that. There should be no surprises other than I'm also surprised by reading uh, each of these, the amount of time uh, that was devoted in putting together the responses. The private sector doesn't do that if they think they're on a fishing trip. So I, I'm very pleased with the process. And uh, it's just part of where we're, where we're headed. Eventually, uh, we'll be ready to really looking, look to the private sector for uh, their participation in funding. We're just not there yet. OK. All right. With that, thank you. Um, I know it's getting late, but we do have uh, Mr. Curtin gave us a good segue into the next item on the agenda, which is uh,